So um, we'll start with refuge in bodhicitta. And um, after we do refuge in bodhicitta, we'll just spend a few minutes reflecting and reviewing on uh, what we did last time um, as a meditation rather than as, um, you know, presentation because it's familiar to us. So we'll just kind of reconnect with the main ideas of the course. So if you want to find a nice straight posture. Sangay <laughs> Rolla pinches sung a drupasho sung a chudum so gi chunam la Janju padu dani gapsuchi Dagi chun yan gi pe sonam gi Rolla pinches sung a drupasho And so connecting with refuge in Bodhicitta. And so thinking in particular, I'm studying Wheel of Sharp Weapons in order to slay Yama, the Lord of Death, karma and disturbing emotions, uncontrolled old age sickness and death, birth. And I do that not just for my own sake, but in order to be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. May I be like the peacock in the poison grove, the bodhisattva taking on disturbing emotions, samsaric environments, suffering, using everything as fuel for the path. Whenever hardship arises, may I see it as the wheel of sharp weapons returning. Results from causes I created myself in the past. All of this suffering and hardship came from the self-cherishing thought May I give it back to the self-cherishing thought? Self-cherishing combined with self-grasping. And so I will slay the Lord of Death and I will transform these poisons. Where there is self-grasping, I'll apply the wisdom realizing emptiness. Where there is self-cherishing, I'll apply cherishing others, the mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta. And in that way, enriching the colors of my practice, like the beauty of a peacock. and relaxing your attention.
Okay. So welcome everybody. Good morning, good evening, good night, depending on where you are. <laughs> and um, so this is a uh, part two of our Wheel of Sharp Weapons class. And, um, you know, we could keep coming back to it as years go by if you want to. But today I'm going to highlight some of the, the verses that I think are most directly applicable to us in our daily life. Um, the most directly showing us the, the way we can make our practice stronger and also a way of understanding karma and obstacles, um, seeing where they come from so that we can check, do we still do them or not? Yeah, are we still creating the same causes for the same kind of suffering that we don't want right now? And if we see that, then we can catch it and change. Um, and so this is, is a text that, you know, again and again kind of makes you go, oh no. <laughs> but then, oh good, that's where it came from. I wondered, it seemed random, it seemed out of nowhere. Right, it has a cause. I knew that it has a cause, but now I see that I'm continuing to create the cause for that suffering. Yikes, I better stop. Yeah, um, rather than yikes, I'm a bad person. Please, at no point, someone will do this. Please don't do this. Please don't read this text as a weapon of self-punishment. Find it a way of liberating yourself from negative habits that have never served you. And um, it's also very easy that when we read these verses that we'll um, notice people we know when we read through them and go, oh my gosh, that's so much like so-and-so. And, -so. and um, that's a really natural thing to happen when you start deep self-examination is to look at the faults of others because it's so confronting to look at your own stuff. So if you do read some of these verses and notice that you're recognizing people in your life, recognize that, but then come back to what am I getting up to? So keep making it personal, personal, personal. So, um, so just to kind of um, get us back oriented, because it's been a couple weeks, this text was written by Dharma Rakshita, who was one of the teachers of Atisha. And Atisha is one of our big names in Tibetan Buddhism, who um, basically made the Lam Rim. He arranged all of the stages of the path from the Buddha in order, in completion, after going all over the place in Asia, gathering and tidying the Dharma back up, which had become kind of degenerate and uh, incomplete in various places. So he um, studied in India with Dharma Rakshita and learned a lot of this mind training or Lojong teachings. Of course, he also learned um, from Maitra Yogi in India and then in Sumatra, he learned from Sirlingpa. So Atisha learned from lots of teachers. Dharma Rakshita wasn't his only teacher, but um, this is where he got the, the um, ideas that are found in the Wheel of Sharp Weapons. So then of course from Atisha, we get Lama Tsongkhapa who wrote the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, which is our you know, kind of Buddhist Bible in the Kalukpa tradition. So Dharma Rakshita had a really strong influence in helping us understand Tonglen giving and taking practice helping us look at karma differently. Um, because normally when we study karma, it's to help us have a healthy fear of the lower realms and a healthy fear of what our untamed mind will create. And it's more small scope, middle scope teachings when we look at karma normally. And in this context, we're looking at karmic cause and effect in order to fuel bodhicitta. So we're looking at karma in a different way in these teachings, which is really um, quite intriguing and quite profound. So um, that's kind of a, a nice feature of the Wheel of Sharp Weapons, this text that we're looking at. So Dharma Rakshita is the author. And then the main themes are basically how to overcome self-grasping and self-cherishing. Yeah, how to overcome self-grasping and self-cherishing. So what's the difference between self-grasping and self-cherishing? Does anybody remember? It doesn't have to be perfect technical definitions, just kind of general impressions about the difference between the two. They are best friends, of course, for us, unfortunately. <laughs> because uh, uh, the self is the main issue, the main theme, the main thing. This is self-cherishing. Uh, uh, in my life, uh, I have to take care of myself. And this is why I'm grasping what is good for me and what is not good for me and for my friends and beloved one. Yep, yep, that, that is 
good old self-cherishing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. And uh, self-grasping. Yeah, Tipi. Maybe, maybe self-grasping is uh, the view of the self as uh, independent. And this brings self-cherishing as, oh, now I have to take care of it. Nice. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep, you guys got it. So um, the self-grasping that we're talking about is an afflicted view, isn't it? It's an afflicted view that views the I in your own mental continuum and holds it to exist inherently. And that type of self-grasping is the root of samsara. There are lots of other kinds of self-grasping which are similarly unfortunate. But when we're talking about the root of samsara that we want to cut, we cut it with what? The wisdom realizing emptiness, right? So we cut the root of samsara with the wisdom realizing emptiness or the antidote to self-cherishing is wisdom, correct view. You can frame it in those ways too. But what we're looking at here is ultimate bodhicitta, which is bodhicitta together with an understanding of emptiness, roughly speaking. And bodhicitta is the antidote to self-cherishing. Yeah, so wisdom's the antidote to self-grasping. Bodhicitta is the, the antidote to self-cherishing. Yeah, those are our two um, poisons and our two antidotes. Um, so we're kind of clear on that. So whenever you, you read within the text the various types of poison that the peacocks are using in their poison grove, the, the poisons that they're using are self-cherishing and self-grasping, which each of them on their own are much less problematic than when they're combined. Yeah, for us, they're together. They're always together. But there are cases where someone could have one and not the other. Can you think of like examples of uh, someone who might have self-cherishing but no self-grasping? I'm not sure, but it uh, could be that on the way along the path, uh, when you probably realize emptiness already and you get rid of the afflictive emotions, you still have some imprints of self-cherishing. I'm not sure. <laughs> could be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very nice. Yep. Um, exactly. So like, for example, a Hinayana Arhat or a foundational vehicle Arhat may have, um, they have realized emptiness directly. They've, you know, gone to the end of their particular path. So they're not causing harm to others. They're very kind. They're very compassionate, but they don't have active taking responsibility for others in the same way that a Bodhisattva does. So they're form of self-cherishing isn't the damaging form that's mixed with self-grasping, which means that what they have is just looking after their own self-interest, but without any expense to others. What it does is it allows them to abide in the extreme of peace, right? It allows them to stay in nirvana without finishing their path going to full enlightenment Buddhahood. So, um, you know, it's, again, if you had, um, no self-grasping, but a little bit of self-cherishing, that self-cherishing wouldn't be causing a lot of trouble, but you wouldn't be done with your path. Then there could be a case of someone who has very little self-cherishing, but does have self-grasping. What do you think it would be an example of that? Self-cherishing, shrinking, but still self-grasping. Arya Bodhisattva. Talia. Talia. Maybe you know someone who who holds on to his eye, me, 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 you know, uh, and he's really stuck there. He feels like he's, you know, not self um, cherishing, but in reality, he's really grasping to his own, um, you know, self. An narcissist, I think. Interesting. Interesting. I'm not a psychologist, but. <laughs> Depends what kind of psychology, trust me. <laughs> um, so it's, um, yeah, it's interesting to explore this idea of could you still have self-grasping, but not really have much self-cherishing? Yeah, self-grasping that is viewing the I as inherently existent. Yeah, seeing that the I is inherently existent, but then doesn't have indifference to others, isn't looking down on others, isn't damaging others. It seems kind of odd to think of it that way, but what about an Arya Bodhisattva? An Arya Bodhisattva has realized emptiness directly, and so their self-cherishing is, or their self-grasping is much diminished, and as they work along the path of meditation, they're overcoming more and more obscurations, aren't they? Um, so they have little self-grasping, but they still have some. 
but their self-cherishing is much diminished, right? Their self-cherishing is much diminished for a bodhisattva because a bodhisattva has uncontrived bodhicitta from the path of accumulation onward. So uncontrived bodhicitta really does cut the habit of self-cherishing right in half you know, and then, and then in half and half and half and half as you go through the stages. So to have uncontrived bodhicitta, you don't need to have realized emptiness. It helps, <laughs> but you don't need to have realized emptiness. You do need some renunciation. Yeah, you do need some renunciation. You need uncontrived renunciation to develop the path of accumulation. So that's, that's something interesting to explore because if you look at the verses, right? So if you look at, for example, verse six, it says, and thus bodhisattvas are likened to peacocks. They live on delusions, those poisonous plants, transforming them into the essence of practice. They thrive in the jungle of everyday life. Whatever is presented, they always accept while destroying the poison of clinging desire. So th they are able to be within the samsaric environment. They're able to see the pleasures of samsara. They're able to um, see the temptations of samsara, but not be swept up in them and not become drunk by them. They're actually able to use them in a way that um, doesn't minimize their renunciation. Because their bodhicitta is so strong that the temptation is less, because their renunciation is so strong, their temptation is less. So for us, we might be very kind, very compassionate people in the right context, right? In the right context, we're very nice, kind, patient, compassionate people who are totally altruistic and there for others, but then tweak circumstance a little bit, you know, what, make it a little bit too hot for us or a little bit too cold for us or make something very tempting available to us. You know, we might not ever watch a certain kind of thing or read a certain kind of thing, but then we're on an airplane and then there's the whole spectrum of, of possibilities there on the back of our airplane seat and we could choose any sort of, you know, nonsense movie or rubbish, whatever. And because it's right there in front of us, then the temptation is harder to resist than if it's just never in our house, you know? Or you're very sweet and kind unless a certain person comes to dinner, yeah. Or you're very, very good with your marriage. You have perfect marriage vows. You would never consider looking at another person unless <laughs> a certain type of person comes to dinner. And then your eye is sort of like, hmm, yeah. So for a bodhisattva, they've broken the spell. Yeah, they're, they're breaking the spell of samsara because really for us, part of us still very much believes that if we got samsara organized just right, we could be happy all the time. Yeah, it really, part of us still thinks we can get samsara to work for us. And that all of the things of samsara aren't perfect, but maybe we, if we just keep tweaking it, you know, one more home renovation, one more marriage, one more, what, one more career change, you know, if, then it'll be, you know, good enough and then I'll be satisfied. And what usually happens is that those rare times you do get everything you want, you're not satisfied anyway, right? Then your level of desire and need just expands to fit the new space that you're in. You know, you know it's never enough anyway. But you know, even while you're lingering in, maybe if I just get this all together, it will be better. Your mind is hungry and seeking and you know, really disempowering itself by looking outward. So if we can remember that the, the peacocks are not um, wandering around in the desert, they're wandering around in a beautiful jungle, all right? They're wandering around with things that normally would make others ill, but they're able to take them on the path because of the strength of their renunciation and the strength of their bodhicitta and eventually the strength of their wisdom realizing emptiness. So this is showing us that the details of our life, the outside things of our life don't really have to change. Of course, you know, we should do what we can in terms of politics and activism. Of course, we should recycle when we can, blah, 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 sure. But at the end of the day, the external world should not be our main emphasis because the external world is never perfectible. And our response to the external world is gonna be much different if our internal world is sorted. Yeah, the things that disrupt, that disrupt us and steal our peace won't anymore. And then we're in the best position to help.
Right. So to be the peacock in the poison grove and not to be the crow, right? So the, the other theme that we were looking at is um, the crow. So on uh, verse four, it says, now desire is the jungle of poisonous plants here. Only brave ones like peacocks can thrive on such fare. If cowardly beings like crows were to try it, because they are greedy, they might lose their lives. So for a cowardly person or for an ordinary person or an immature childish being, so us, <laughs> right so us the crow um, for us to use too much afflictions on the path will be the death of virtue it will be the death of virtue which is why you can intellectually understand some of the philosophy behind tantra but to practice it is very dangerous unless you have bodhicitta and renunciation yeah, because you'll start, you know, playing with very volatile emotions that are very intriguing and dramatic. And it's very easy to then become sucked into the drama of them and forget the point. Yeah, in this case, it's very easy to start transforming the things that you see around you and then get lost in the wrong way of thinking about it. You know, you can go too far of thinking, um, oh no, everything's fine. It's all good. It's all good. And be one of those lovely sort of um, archetypal cruisy surfer type of people, <laughs> you know, oh, it's all good. It's not all good. It's samsaric. But, you know, sort of skipping over all of the pain of life by overly reframing or sort of making the edges and the sharpness fuzzy. Yeah or saying nothing in samsara is good or ever could be good. How dare you ever go to the movies and become so strict and so uptight that you then blow a gasket or like pop a fuse because you're going too tight, too fast for your actual capabilities. So for us, we need to really be careful about knowing what we know intellectually and then what our assumptions are for how much we can bring that into our own practice and to not have kind of a spiritual pride that thinks just because we understand we can do because the danger of spiritual pride is that once you think you can do and then you try to and then you can't you have kind of a self -humili humiliation and you look down on yourself and you crash and you started from pride and now you're in depression yeah or you started in pride and now you're in arrogant defensiveness yeah so, so understanding intellectually is the first step and it's so key, but don't feel like just because you get it, you should be able to do it. You know, really give yourself space and patience. Yeah, to integrate and digest and process, you know, baby, baby steps. Yeah, very gently. So the crows are the other theme. Um, and so these are the basic things that we're looking at. We're also later in the text gonna come to um, this wheel of sharp weapons phrasing a lot. So remembering that the wheel of sharp weapons that they're describing, um, the look of it would be something similar to like, I don't know what ninjas use, a throwing star, right? A bit like that. Um, or um, I don't know, in Australia, boomerang, <laughs> right? But basically something that, um, that could come back to you, right? It could come back to you if thrown the right way. And this is our karma. Right. So um, whatever pain we're experiencing to think I was the one that threw it. That's why I'm the one catching it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So we're going to start unpacking a few of the verses that we haven't looked at yet. Are there any questions about the main themes before we go into new verses? Peacocks, crows, self-grasping, self-cherishing. Got it? Yep. Cool. Okay. All right, so we're gonna switch now to verse 13. Okay, so it says, when we lack any freedom, but must obey others, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we have looked down on those who were lowly and used them as servants for our own selfish needs. Hereafter, let's offer our services to others with humble devotion of body and life. So this is talking about um, when you lack freedom, it's not just, you know, the extreme form, like if you're a slave, but the form of, for example, when you're too busy to do what you want, 
right? So you, there's things you want to do. There's virtuous, positive activities. Maybe there's a retreat you've always been hanging out for or a set of teachings you've always been wanting to do. And you're just too busy with prior commitments that you can't get out of that case. Um, then the other case is if, for example, you're a bit oppressed by a very domineering boss yeah, at your work or a very domineering partner in your house or a very domineering abbot in your monastery, um, but you're kind of oppressed by someone in authority, that. So of course there are logistical reasons for that, but have you noticed that if you ever left a job that you didn't like, that sometimes you wind up in your new job having similar dynamics. You know, I don't know about you, but I had four different jobs in a row where I did very different things, but I somehow wound up having the same boss in all four jobs, just in a different form. Yeah, just in a different form. Pros and cons to that, pros and cons. And of course, there are worldly psychological reasons for that. There's things that we bring out of each other just by our communication style. And these teachings aren't negating that but remembering that those are conditions, right? Those are conditions for our experience. They're not the substantial cause. So the substantial cause of, you know, not getting to do what you want and feeling lack of freedom is having deprived others of freedom, right? Having deprived others of freedom. We've used them, um, we've looked down on them, and we've um, had selfish needs in response to those that we've had power over. So, if we just sit for a minute and look at who do we have power over in our life right now, maybe only our cat, right? Maybe that's the only one we're in charge of, or dog. But it could be that we um, have some authority that we don't recognize or own in our circle of friends. We might be the dominant one in a certain circle of friends. We wouldn't call it authority. We wouldn't call it power, but we kind of can be dominant. Or we're dominant in a certain area of our workplace or spiritual life. So if you can just think, where, where do I have some, some sort of power or authority? Do I take that for granted or take advantage of that and let my pride marry up with that authority and become controlling, domineering, oppressive, self-centered when I have that? And, you know, kind of neglect the needs of the people I'm responsible for. Yeah. So when we're looking at any of these verses, what we're, what we're checking is, am I having this experience currently? You know, and if I am, then here's what I did in the past that caused it. And I'm also looking at, am I continuing to create the causes for that right now? Yeah, so sort of check with two minds. The mind that says, okay, does, is this even one that applies to me? Does this happen to me right now? If it does, here's where it came from. Do I still do it? Now, if you don't still do it, if it's something that you, it's not a habit anymore for you, then you can sort of be satisfied that right now your hardships will play themselves out and exhaust themselves and finish. And it won't be a forever situation, especially if you actively purify. Yeah, if you actively purify, then anything of that type, you can really start be wiping away, wiping away, and your current situation is not forever. But your current situation lacking freedom could be almost endless if you keep creating the causes for it. So just as you feel oppressed, check, are you oppressing others? Does that make sense? So with each of these, you're just doing that kind of check of, do, does this happen to me? Where I, you know, feel under the thumb of my responsibilities or under the thumb of people in authority. I don't like that feeling. Where did it come from? not actually from them or the situation. Yeah, those were conditions, not causes. Yeah, so this a, it's an interesting one to look at. And then when we hear only language that is foul and abusive, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we have said many things without thinking. We have slandered and caused many friendships to end. Hereafter, let's censure all thoughtless remarks. So this verse 14 is talking about non-virtues of speech ripening. So when we hear um, only language that is foul and abusive, it can mean criticism, right? But it can also mean when you keep coming across bad news. Yeah? 
So when you keep coming across bad news that is disturbing your mind and agitating your mind, of course, you could just turn off the computer and not see the bad news, right? <laughs> but if it just keeps flooding into your system, ask yourself, am I someone who perpetuates bad news? Like, for example, with our situation now, when you hear some new bad element about this virus that's going around, there's a part of sharing information that's really functional and nice, you know, to make sure everybody's on board and understands the new piece of information. But then there's a part of it that's just like wanting something dramatic to talk about and sort of enjoys the drama. Yeah, even though it's painful and um, anxious making, there can be a part of us that shares information out of a little bit of a love of drama. Um, and so just checking if, if we are hearing things we don't want to hear, are we saying or sharing information we don't want to um, come back to us? Are we doing the same thing? Yeah. So it's, it's delicate, isn't it? When are we sharing information that's useful? And when are we um, just stirring the pot? Yeah, this can be when we dig up old dramas as well. Right, if there was some old issue with friends or family members or whatever from 10 years ago, and now something a little bit similar happens, now you need to bring in every history from the past of all of the times they've been that way. Remember when they were like this, remember when, remember when. You know, this can create the cause for us to then hear foul speech, criticism, all this stuff that is really unpleasant. Yeah, so it's just, it's just a checking, right? Do I do this? Do I experience this? Okay. Because in reading these, we can also be thinking, how do we help the people around us not experience the wheel of sharp weapons returning in such a harsh way? So, you know, we're not a cause for other people's state of mind, but we are a condition. So also kind of thinking in the back of your mind, um, how can I not contribute to their suffering and uh, their creation of new suffering? All right, so verse 15. When we are born in an oppressive and wretched conditions, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we have always had negative out outlooks. We have criticized others, seeing only their flaws. Hereafter, let's cultivate positive feelings and view our surrounding as stainless and pure. So, Born in an oppressive and wretched conditions, this can be born um, in a place where there's always conflict, when there's places, when you're born in a place where um, the borders aren't clear, <laughs> when you're born in a place where there is a lot of um, discussion about who owns what and why, and that isn't a friendly collaborative discussion. It can also be um, the family that you're born into. If you're born into a family that's really aggressive or violent, um, that is a really critical family that has a lot of abusive habits. Yeah, um, so just taking a minute and thinking if that's ever the case in our life right now, <laughs> which can be. I'm not saying anything. And then <laughs> we, we just check. Um, Till now, we've always had negative outlooks. So. You can see the danger in looking at this, can't you? You think, oh, okay, I'm in a situation or an environment or a country that has a lot of conflict. That means I can't have a negative outlook because I don't want my future life to be difficult like this. I need to have a positive outlook. I need to have a positive outlook. You can see the danger, right? You could get into a total spiritual bypassing way of being where you pretend like nothing is ever wrong. Yeah, and that could be really um, not functional, not useful at all. All right, so that's not what's being said. It's, it's what's being said is check our tendency to always look at the negative. Check our tendency to always look at the negative. In normal conversations in our mind, your internal narrative, in conversations you're having with other people, what percentage of the content is exploring the negative and the unfortunate? You know, just kind of thinking percentage wise. Because that percentage isn't necessarily the self-existent percentage of difficulty in the life. 
is it? You know, if you're talking about, say, your yard, let's talk about your yard, whatever your yard is. What percentage of your yard is actually quite beautiful and quite nice? And then you're sort of annoyed at one corner of the yard and you always talk about that one corner that's just overgrown and blah, 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 you know, that one little corner when the whole rest of your garden is beautiful. Yeah. Or um, you have a very nice uh, situation at work, you have meaningful work that you love, you're surrounded by people that all care about things, but there's this one coworker who's a bit annoying and they're who you always talk about. Do you know what I mean? Right? So it's so easy for us to like zero in on the negative, even though the negative is often a very small percentage. Yeah? It's so human, isn't it? It's so human. But if we don't want to be reborn in a place where there's always conflict, we need to stop zeroing in on things that create inner and outer conflict. Yeah, so it doesn't mean jumping over when there is conflict. It means to kind of check that habit that always needs to zoom in on the negative and make that the main thing that we talk about in life. You know, if, if your friend calls you up and says, oh, hey, how are you going? Do you usually say, oh, my gosh, today, let me tell you what happened today, <laughs> right? Or do you say, hey, oh, guess what happened today, you know? Just as your default, you know, as your automatic, yeah. Thoughts on that? <laughs> So we read these and um, we see ourselves and we laugh and try to change. Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah, please, Alona, yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, assuming there is a country with a conflict without borders and <laughs> with the, some uh, people thinking they own or they don't own some territories. Um, it's difficult not to think about it because when you have an opinion, it's always uh, bad for one side and good for the other side. So, and, and when you live in a, in a place like this, you, you, you have an opinion because you are, um, you are mixed with the conflict personally. So how can we look at it? Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's exactly right to make it really personal and direct to your situation. It, it really is. We all have to do that with all of these because there's the ideal that we think that's beautiful and I'd like to think that way and then there's the reality of yes but <laughs> yes but right and you know in these situations it's it's a bit like um if you were ever a little kid fighting on the playground and your teacher said try to put yourself in the other person's shoes you know put yourself in their shoes right it's just good old-fashioned playground wisdom you know, what is it like from their perspective? What is it like from your perspective? Just like a scientist, objectively, without all the emotions, without all the history, without all of the stuff and the baggage in your mind, just every once in a while, or regularly, take a step back and, and ask yourself, what is this situation for me and us? What is the situation like for them? What is, you know, and just to move your mind back and forth. What is it like for us? What is it like for them? What is the logic I have with my opinions? What is the logic they have for theirs? What is the logic they have for theirs? What is the logic they have for theirs? I might not agree with it, but what is it? Put your mind into their place. You know, I, I remember my mom used to do a lot of environmental activism when I was a kid. And um, there was a lot of conflict around water rights in uh, Native American communities and farmers, right? That's classic tale, right? <laughs> classic tale. So the Native American folks had certain ideas about um, the importance of water and water rights in their land, and the farmers had certain ideas about the need to irrigate and blah, blah, blah. Classic tale. Neither side was listening to each other because they were sure that they were right. So conflict, right? And what my mom found was that big rallies and big, you know, conferences were satisfying for the respective groups to feel connection to each other, but were not very actually effective in getting their message across, right? What was useful in getting their message across was kitchen table conversations, yeah, of both sides just sitting, sitting together and being like, here's where I'm coming from, yeah? And when there was just those casual 
you know, let your hair down, have a cup of coffee. Let's just, you know, let's just be two human beings talking to each other. There was a lot more movement that could happen. So I'm not saying things like rallies and things like that aren't useful, but to remember that they can also just reinforce the anger of the respective groups and make it harder to hear each other. You know, at their best, they're a way to feel connected with other people so you feel like you're not alone in whatever your positive view is. But often they take that good reason and expands into, let's just all be angry together and feel self-righteous. Yeah, and then it's hard to hear anyone about anything. So I know it sounds so simplistic to say, put yourself <laughs> in someone else's shoes. Sounds so simplistic. You've heard it since you were five years old. And yet it's still true. Yeah, it's still true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it helps to think of them as family members too, I think. If you can think there are family members that you will never give up on and that you will always love, but you fundamentally disagree with. Right? Don't we all have a family member somewhere that we like fundamentally disagree with their politics or their way of life or something? But they're our relative and we love them, right? <laughs> so if you can kind of like also have that of what's a way to not have to agree in order to have harmony? Because often we assume for there to be harmony, there must be agreement. That's not actually true. You can have completely different views and still care about each other. Right, so, so kind of, you know, using that example that we all have that one difficult relative, you know, I have a whole side of my family that still has mullet haircuts on purpose, a number of off-road vehicles, they stockpile weapons, you know, they're like an American documentary of, you know, doomsday preppers, and I love them dearly, but we just do not talk about politics, right, safety first, <laughs> right, and they look at me and they're like, what is she wearing, what is she doing, what on earth, anyway, cup of tea. You know, and, and this is the thing is that agreement does not um, necessitate the ingredients for love. Yeah, so there's that too. So, so when we're looking at this verse, I think it's, it's so important to remember how often we look to the negative and we look to the impossible and we pick on the things that are problematic as if that is the main part of the story. I mean, even if we look at this situation we're in right now with um, the country that a lot of us are in, it's remarkable how often there isn't war, right? It's remarkable how often people do just kind of like get on with life, even though there's just some fundamental conflicts about what belongs to who and how life should be. It's actually quite amazing that there's not bombs going off constantly. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so, but if we want um, that to be even less a potential, <laughs> we need to look at creating the causes for peace. Yeah, so, um, so then I thought we'd jump to um, verse 19. Yeah, jump to verse 19. And if during the breaks you find a verse that you particularly want to explore, please highlight it and we can bring it up. But um, I know we don't have time to go through all of them, so I'm just jumping around. So this one's on page seven. And it says, um, when things we require for daily consumption and use fall apart or are wasted or spoiled, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we've been careless with others' possessions. Hereafter, let's give them whatever they need. So when the things we require for daily consumption, you know, our daily needs, our daily resources, um, fall apart or are wasted and spoiled. This is an interesting one to explore, isn't it? Um, this is when, I don't know, do you have people in your family who seem to have clothes that last forever? And people in your family whose clothes just seem to fall apart and they're constantly needing new clothes? Um, do you have people that seem to always be breaking things and s weird things always are happening with their computers, right? They're always getting a random virus. They're always having some weird thing happen with their computer or their car is always falling apart, right? Or our car is always falling apart as opposed to someone with exactly the same computer or exactly the same car seems to just keep running. You know, it, it's interesting to like make it parallel, right? Not, you know, people who have better things, but people who have the same things and one wears out first. 
Of course, there's outsides for this, but we're looking at the karmic reason for this. If the things that we use are always falling apart or spoiling. Um, in my teacher's commentary to this, he was saying, it's also the case of if two people have the same job and do the same work, and one of them gets paid less than the other. Yeah, if one of them gets paid less than the other. So, so this is, of course, very interesting for women because we're always getting paid less than men for doing the same job, right? And we think, okay, the condition for that is the patriarchy, right? The condition for that is general misogyny, but the cause is us, right? The cause, the substantial cause, is us having misused the possessions of others, us having stolen, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, of course, if the condition was there, then the cause wouldn't ripen into suffering. But, you know, this becomes a really interesting dance when, when uh, Kensu Rinpoche Geshitashi Sering said this during the commentary, I think, in 2006. You know, if two people get uh, paid differently for doing exactly the same job, immediately, you know, the women in the room were like, hmm? 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 <laughs> Misogyny! <laughs> right? But, um, but, yeah, what causes it? You know, and um, it, it is interesting to explore right now when we have things that belong to other people, how do we treat them? You know, um, things held in common by a community, things held in common in a family, as well as possessions of others that we get to use. So it's not just stealing, right? It, this is talking about the result of stealing, but it's also talking about the result of things related to stealing, like borrowing and not giving things back that you've borrowed, right? Someone has lent you money and you don't repay them. Um, things belong to the whole share house, but you use them as if they're, that you're the only one who owns them. So um, this, this conversation comes up a lot in monasteries and nunneries where lots of possessions are communally owned. And when something is communally owned, often you treat it less well than if, it, if you own it. From a karmic perspective, if it's communally owned, you should treat it much better than if you personally own it, right? Just, you know, to be a good citizen, of course, but more than that, because of the karmic reasons that it's like every person in that community owns it. So if you harm it, now you have a karmic relationship with each person who communally owns it. So thinking about like government property or public land, you know, so if you're going for a hike in the woods and it's public land that's owned by the country or whatever, and you litter and throw stuff away, but you know, and you throw your pop can out into the forest, that's actually a heavier karma than if you did that in your own backyard. Yeah, for example. So if um, the things that we use don't last as long as we want them to, um, and that is the case for everything, right? For some people, it's worse than others, but nothing we have can last forever without any maintenance. Yeah, you can't have the same car for 20 years and not have any maintenance. You can't have the same house, the same whatever, without needing any maintenance. The fact that we need maintenance on things partially is because of stealing, not valuing the possessions of others, misusing the things of others, etc. Yeah, so kind of expanding the whole concept of what is it to steal or take what isn't freely offered to remember it also has elements of, of these other reasons. Does that, does that make sense though? Yeah, I, I find this one really interesting because um, we get so annoyed when things fall apart. We're so annoyed. Oh, it's made like crap. Things aren't made the, well, the way they used to be, you know? It's like, well, that might be the case. However, two people could have the same cup and you keep breaking yours and they've had it for 20 years unbroken. You know, it's interesting to look at. Yeah. Okay, um, the next one, this applies to all of us, I think this verse 20, um, and it's, it's a little bit confronting, but it's really useful, this verse 20. It says, when our minds are unclear and our hearts are unhappy, we are bored doing virtue but excited by vice. This is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we've led others to acts of non-virtue. Hereafter, let's never provide the conditions that rouse them to follow their negative traits. So um, in the commentary, it says when our minds are unclear can refer to especially during meditation. 
So, you know, when you're meditating and you just can't stop falling asleep or you're meditating and that like haze keeps creeping in or um, you're just scattered and scattered and scattered, no matter how much you want to be sitting and want to be doing the meditation, it's just like, like swarm of angry bees, depending on your style, right? So when you just can't get a clear mind, yeah, when you can't get a clear mind, what is that about? Sometimes you need a nap, sure, but looking at the, the big cause, um, when our hearts are unhappy, what is the cause for happiness? Positive states of mind, positive actions. What is the cause for an unhappy mind? Negative states of mind, negative actions. So when our hearts are unhappy and we're bored doing vir virtue, but the idea of doing the wrong thing is kind of intriguing to us, that's unfortunate, right? But it's quite common. Um, so it says we've led others to acts of non-virtue. In the commentary, it says we've, we've also prevented people from doing virtue. Yeah, so um, this can come up when um, the people around us are doing really positive work. And right now we don't feel like it and we're a little bit jealous of the energy they're putting into this virtuous work. And we're kind of doing, look at me, look at me, you know, and we sort of pull them from focus. Yeah, because we're a little bit jealous that they're doing something um, really important or really virtuous and they're not paying attention to us or um, we don't feel like joining them in it. So we try to distract them or tempt them with something more worldly. You know, they're about to go meditate and you say, come watch this Netflix, whatever, you know. Um, so preventing people from doing virtue either by sort of tantalizing them with um, temptations or by distracting them or um, looking down on them. Um, when That's very much happening with me today. This is my third I mean, it's, it's six o'clock, almost six o'clock in the evening where I am. It's my third session today. My daughter has gone out to go and stay with, to visit somebody else because she's so jealous of me being on here all day and not with her. Exactly what's happened today. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's like normal and human and like, you know, also really uh, it's an unfortunate non-virtue because if you were like working on a home maintenance project, and she was interrupting you, it would be a lot less negative than the fact that you're trying to do Dharma classes and she's interrupting you, right? And, um, and so it is, it's good to look at it from both directions of if someone is trying to pull us off course to meet it with so much compassion and to stick to our guns. You know, that, that's really delicate, isn't it? To be really compassionate about the fact that they want more, yeah. Um, there's a question in the messenger that says, can you talk more about how to shift your focus on the positive things without forcing it artificially? Yeah. Um, to shift your focus to the positive things, sometimes we underestimate how positive our thoughts actually are. So if you can think, I want to meditate, say, say, I want to meditate. How do I get myself to meditate without forcing it? Well, just think about the benefits of it longer, right? Rather than say, I'm just going to do it because a good girl does it and I must force myself to do it. Give yourself a break and just sit with what are the benefits of meditation? What are the disadvantages of when I've not been meditating? Let's just sit with reasons for a little bit longer rather than trying to force myself to the higher thing before I'm genuinely in the space for it. You know, this kind of discipline that we have with ourselves needs to not be at all harsh um, because it doesn't work if it's harsh. It works short term and then there's a backlash. Yeah. So uh, I guess to make sure that things aren't artificial, you just sit with your motivation longer than the actual going about and doing it. Just sit with what are my reasons? What is my purpose? Just, you know, really clarify that that generates the aspiration into a strong enough aspiration that it can pop into a joyous effort. Yeah. So if you're remembering like um, in the concentration section, the antidotes to laziness, right? First you have faith or conviction that something is useful and good to do. And that faith then builds into an aspiration that wants to. And if you want to long enough, then when you do it, it's joyful. And if you do something joyfully long enough, it becomes easy. 
pliancy, right? So if you can kind of like remember that sequence of if the doing it isn't coming easy, I need to go back a few steps. But even those going back a few steps are quite virtuous steps. Just thinking about why should I practice is a virtuous thing to think about. You know, it's really positive. Yeah. But I don't know, is that your question? Did you have a, another question underneath it? Um, I was um, not talking so much about practice. It's not hard to think about the positive aspects of practice. It's hard to think about the positive aspects um, of when you're not practicing. In between <laughs> sessions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, same, same rule applies. Yeah. Same rule applies of, um, before you're going into your in-between session, how much more beneficial is it when you're talking about things in a non-divisive, non-harsh kind of way? You know, when you've been really letting yourself go verbally with friends and you've just been like talking about any old thing in a non-virtuous way, you know, a bit divisive, a bit gossipy, a bit bitchy, a bit whatever. It can be kind of fun while you're in it. And then afterwards you're like, oh, you got a bit of a cringe, you know, like, oh, I really wish I hadn't said that, or I wish I hadn't shared that, or that's really not in alignment with my path. That like inner cringe of that whole conversation is just a whole amount of non-virtue I'm gonna need to purify tonight. Great. <laughs> You know, if you can remember those times where you've really regretted the non-virtue in an everyday life, it can kind of protect you for the next little chapter of the day. But to kind of break up the day into some chapters so you don't overwhelm yourself with needing to be good all day, right? Just think, okay, in the next chapter, I'm gonna be doing this and this and this. The opportunities for non-virtue are, what are the disadvantage of letting myself fall into that? Yeah. What's been the result of that in the past that I don't like? Just kind of prepare yourself. Yeah. But, but don't try and like force the whole day into some shape that's not practical. Just kind of see what pieces you can adjust a bit. You know, if you always get a bit snarky in a staff meeting, you know, and you always get a bit sort of, yes, but if these people did their job right, I wouldn't have this problem here rah, 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 or whatever, you know, like staff meeting issues you can say all right my project right now is staff meetings <laughs> okay rather than all human conflicts in my life until the end of time you'll overwhelm yourself right just think today's staff meeting how can i prevent divisive speech how can i you know minimize harsh speech that's the project because because right that's my path Right? Not because a good girl should, or I should, 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 but because that's actually what you value more and that's what you'll be happy with afterwards. You know, there's that deep satisfaction in living in alignment with your core values. It's so satisfying when you've lived a day really ethically. And when you haven't lived a day ethically, there's a lot more to disturb your mind at, before sleep, where you just kind of like, uh, that wasn't quite right. Slowly, slowly. So now we're going to the next chapter is cup of tea for half an hour. And in that chapter, what are the ways that are traditionally um, might lead you to not virtuous ways of thinking and how to prevent that? So, you know, eat what you're going to eat, drink what you're going to drink, talk to who you're going to talk to, and how can you pull bodhicitta into those very ordinary events? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a different translation of the text. Yep. Um, I'll, the one I'm using, the translation of the text I'm using is the Alexander Burson poetic rendering um, because he gave us permission to use it in a public setting. So um, I'll, uh, I'll email, I'll put it into the messenger section and um, see you in a half an hour, half hour break. <laughs>